Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. We live, of course, in the soft, coloured, smelly, tactile world. But these days, most of us also live in the digital world, or at least on its fringes. And today we're going to be talking about living in this future, which can feel alien and odd, but which is lapping all around us. Simon Ings edits a new digital magazine founded through the New Scientist family, which combines science fiction with futurology, and he'll tell us about augmented reality. Anab Jain co-founded the company Superflux, which works on new ideas that other companies want to exploit, including such oddities as prosthetic vision. Charles Arthur's got a good handle on the corporate wars that have got us thus far in a book which looks at the fight between Apple, Google and Microsoft, but we're going to kick off with a full frontal argument about how the rest of us can best survive in this strange new world Nick Harkaway's book, The Blind Giant, is subtitled Being Human in a Digital World. And, Nick, you begin by talking about how, for so many of us, it's either a nightmare dystopian future just ahead of us or it's a utopia. Yeah, absolutely. You you really have two pictures drawn for you if, if you're thinking about the digital world. The one is this extraordinarily dark place where children are sort of wired almost directly into violent video games and where no one has any privacy at all. Um, and the other is a, a bright kind of shining future of distributed voting and perfect democracy achieved through technology uh, and brilliant uh, economic models of startups happening all over the place spontaneously and creating growth and so on. And there's very little uh, sense of an in-between world where we all might actually live. And the, the real point of your book, it seems to me, is that the digital future is not something which is going to happen to us, where we are just the passive recipients of what other people are going to thrust at us. It's something that we can shape ourselves. Absolutely. And this is the thing that I, I really care about, actually, in, in the book. I mean, I care about all of it, but this is the thing I wish people would take away from it, is that we make the future as we go along. Every decision we make, actually, however small, particularly living in, in a sort of liberal democratic capitalist state, buying is voting as well as as just the electoral decisions that we make. And so the really important thing as you go along is to make good decisions on even quite small things. Uh, and the way to do that is is to gather information to yourself. I mean, obviously, people are frightened of some of the information they get, but that's because the world is frightening, not because the technology is frightening. And so when people say, well, the thing is, I'm now so swamped by information thanks to the digital world that's uh, all around me, um, I, I can't cope with it. How can I possibly start to make good decisions rather than bad decisions? I don't even know what that means. I think you have to learn a decision-making skill. It's not a sort of natural thing that happens to you. Just like reading is something you acquire um, throughout your life or you know, when you're at school and so on, decision-making is also a skill you can learn. And it's a skill you can actually build up in the brain. One of the things that I talk about in the book is the phenomenon of neuroplasticity, which is also the thing which people sort of talk about when they say the internet is making us stupid. It's not incidentally making is stupid. It's just changing the way that we make decisions. Well, you've got a great anecdote about Socrates in this regard. Yes. Well, Plato reports Socrates saying that the development of, of writing, of literacy, would cause us all to stop remembering things, because obviously uh, you could just go off and find it written down somewhere, and indeed cause us all to stop thinking properly, because you can always have someone else's opinion, which is written down. And it did change the way that human beings thought, but it wasn't a fundamental catastrophe. Uh, in fact, it was the birth of uh, the modern mind as we understand it. And do you think that where we are now, it's a little bit like that so Plato-Socrates moment, um, it, it's as big as that? I think up to a point it is, but it's very easy to exaggerate what happens because you know you have this extraordinarily dramatic idea that your brain is altered by the things that you do uh, and by digital technology. And of course that's true, but it's only relatively... Uh, it's within very strict bounds. Um, Stephen Pinker talks about this very firmly in his work, and he says, look, you know, there's a great deal that's predetermined in your brain. There's a great deal that comes from your environment, but it is, you know, these mm. things are bounded. The digital world doesn't stop us being uh, able to absorb lots of information. It doesn't stop us being storytelling creatures. It doesn't stop us being interested in, in shapes and pictures. Exactly. It, it, it brings us opportunities. And yes, it brings us dangers as well. But they're the dangers from our world. They're not unique to digital technology and they don't come from it. So let's talk about um, one of those dangers. You point out that technology isn't evenly distributed, as you put it. I mean, some people um, have, have access and, and, and power and other people 
really do feel like they're the, the passive recipients. I think yes, and and I mean, if you're in the developed world, and actually not evenly distributed is William Gibson's uh, wonderful posture on the future. Um, but yes, I, if you're in the developed world and and you feel that you don't have uh, an understanding of this technology, the tr- the simple answer is to go out and get it. It's there for you. Obviously, there are inequalities of the distribution of technology around the world, and those are part and parcel of economic inequality in the world. What are the? Th- I mean, you you talk in the book about the things that we have to remember to do to keep ourselves grounded in the tactile, physical world, while also living in the digital world. I think the first thing is to acknowledge that we are partly. Uh, biological and partly or, or partly sensual and partly cognitive so it's not just a question of being a sort of uh, a little person riding around in your own head sort of looking out through your eyes um, it's very much that you know our thinking takes place in the body as well and we touch and we, we smell and so on and those things are important and to acknowledge them and to, to bring them along so if you feel that you've actually spent too much time in your own head then do something which is very physical or very, very sense orientated like I like making bread I'm terrible at it I make disgusting bread but the process pleases me very much and it takes place on a pre-modern time scale bread yeast grows in its own time you can't sort of put it on pause and say I'll come back to it later it'll go too far you can't hurry it along you'll just get flat bread you know it's it's that experience of learning that there are things which can't be fast forwarded and so on and keeping that in your mind is a way of keeping yourself balanced so to live in the digital world it's important not to let the digital world take over your world it's important to have boundaries yes and at the same time it's important to take ownership of your digital technology and say this is mine and it's my decision if I have my mobile phone switched on that's fine but if I see a call coming in at the wrong moment I may not take it Talking about the way that people can sort of, as it were, fight back or at least shape their digital world, what about um, the growing fear of surveillance, not just by the government, but sort of corporate surveillance, that um, big companies know uh, what you're buying, where you are all the time through your mobile phone, and that actually you're losing... I mean, is there much one can do about that? Well, I think, first of all, there are things you can do about it. I discovered the other day that Facebook was was mapping where people had taken photographs of me, not things that I had done, but things that, but, but, uh, sorry, not things that I'd put into Facebook, but things that other people had put into Facebook about me on a map on my page. Nothing seems to be possible. I can't do anything about that. But I can put other things into Facebook. Um, about where I haven't been on that map to, to, to as it were, throw Satur- off anybody. It and, exactly. Uh, yeah. I mean, and it's, I mean, it's a, it's a trivial thing to do. But yes, it's absolutely true. Um, you know, information is gathered and held about us by a variety of entities, and that is not something to be taken lightly. Um, but at the same time, it's also possible for us to push back. And again, if you take ownership of your technology, if you, if you put your privacy settings the way you want them, you have a shot. But more than that, you can use the power that you have as part of a group of people to push companies to doing things, as we saw when the News of the World's advertisers were assailed by angry readers who didn't, you know, didn't want the, mm. the thing to go on the way it was. Uh, they got together and they said, you know, we are a corporate power now, and you, you know, you've got to stop advertising, and people did. Simon Ings, you come from a sort of digital world, essentially you publish a digital magazine, but do you think we're at the stage now where we start to need guidebooks for how to manage digitally? It's very hard to know where the voice of authority would come from if you were to create a guidebook. Um, I think that... Well, Nick Harkaway, I guess. <laughs> there we are. No, read Nick Harkaway's book. Um, I think one of the, the big problems is that companies can think further into the future than governments. And the more information you have, the more nuanced decisions you can make, unless you're on a five-year or less... Um, electoral cycle. So mm. it does raise the question that who, uh, wh- where, is the, yeah. where are the efficiencies going to be most useful? And it may be that um, the internet and digital technology will show up the weaknesses of uh, political systems faster than they will show up the weaknesses of commercial systems. And Jane, we're going to be looking uh, in a little while at some of the extraordinary yeah. things you're working on at Superflux. But yeah. um, how, how, how concerned do you think people... I mean, clearly people are worried about the digital yeah. future. They do, a lot of people don't really understand it and don't know that they've got any handle on it themselves. Um, I think it's uh, really interesting. Recently, Bruce Sterling spoke uh, in a keynote about the idea of stacks or vertically integrated social media with these five organisations, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook and um, uh, Twitter. Twitter probably... Um, um, are sort of 
controlling um, everything that we do, like you were saying earlier. And I think um, this analogy of the livestock, of us being co- not commodities, but almost livestock, and we are kind of... Um, Corralled and moved yes, around. And- exactly. Although I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure when we become sausages. That's the bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bit. But yes... Charles Arthur. I, I wonder about the... I mean, you, you mentioned that, that uh, the, the fantastic um, William Gibson quote of the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And I, I sort of get the feeling that you're almost portraying the digital world as being binary. There's the minus one of the you know, the kids who are just tuned into video games or the plus one where everything is really great and you have the distributed voting. But, I mean, if you look around, it's not like that at all. You can go to Google where the workers are bussed in, in buses that have Wi-Fi and they get free lunch and they're having a fantastic time the weather's beautiful but equally california where they are is completely broken in terms of the way that its uh, administrative system works they're you know calling out for money from all these companies who say well i'm sure you can find some money from somewhere else but isn't that a perfect model or an example of of one of the dystopian aspects of the world which is that there are little pools of cheerful happy creative uh, prosperous sort of digital um uh, community and around them there's the rest of the world with all its problems yeah, and I think the thing that we have to do is is say, OK, um, this sort of nudging that we talked about earlier, you know, the sort of influencing going, is going on as people gather information about us and they try to cause, that, cause us to do things we might not necessarily do. And we have to kind of gather information about the way we make decisions ourselves and learn to make decisions which are not influenced or which are influenced less. And, I mean, Charles is absolutely right. In, in the book, I have set up a kind of uh, a, a dark and light version of this. And, of course, it's more subtle than that. But, actually, it's very often portrayed as being very one or the other. Binary um, or even digital, one might say, yes. It's more like a point of least picture, <laughs> okay. isn't it? Yeah, I, I think, think that's quite true. No, it is. Now, twice so far in this conversation, the words William Gibson have appeared. <laughs> and it's very interesting that here is a science fiction writer um, who is looked upon as one of the sort of, if not the, the, the gurus, at least one of the pathfinders of where we may be going. And uh, I'm interested in this because Simon Ings, your new magazine, Arc, which is a digital magazine, appears online, um, deliberately takes science fiction writing and places it alongside futurology and so on. And it's part of the new scientist stable. The new scientist is a, as it were, traditional hard uh, science magazine for, for people interested in science. Why would it, why would you play science fiction into the family? Um, the first reason is that it's too much fun not to. I mean, if you want to predict the future, the, most, the best way you can do to predict best way you can predict the future is to make it up Mm -hmm. and we know that our readers of science magazines are interested in technology readers of the present of science are interested in the um, future of technology but the two science and technology are not the same thing and just as in a kitchen you would like an oven and you would like a dishwasher you don't necessarily want a combined oven dishwasher in your kitchen (laughs) so um, we very much wanted to create a, a new vehicle for some of the things our readers are interested in without suddenly mixing um, a, a journal of record with speculation. Which well, I, I, I think I'm allowed to say it is, it, it is a very good read. Um, there are lots of, of things we're just on the edge of um, finding in the shops or, or getting hold of. One of the most interesting ones is augmented reality. Um, I know Google have been working on this, but just tell us what augmented reality is, first of all. Well, essentially, it's a way of sewing information into um, your picture plane or your soundscape using um, earphones or glasses or a mobile phone screen so that the information that is put into the computer is mapped in real time and in a real context with your physical environment so that, for instance, if you're going to make a phone call for someone, you wouldn't just be looking at them on a screen on your phone, but you'd actually have them sitting... Opposite to you across a table. That's the the simplest way. And I can it. imagine. So if I'm sitting around a table, I might be looking at you through my augmented reality specs, and I would have Simon Ings' um, salary, Dali Da, career, this interests that, and so on. As I'm talking to you, sounds quite dangerous if you're trying to walk around with it. It's um, quite extraordinary. We ran a, a short story competition, and virtually every story was about how people didn't want that kind of augmented reality. 
And I think that's the interesting thing about technology is that people will use what they want to use. And there are entire technologies evolved over countless hundreds of years which have disappeared and vanished and are simply curious and so, because people don't actually want to use them in that way. Because eventually, with augmented reality specs, people would want to put adverts onto them. I mean, inevitably to pay for them, just as, as with computer screens, and people take quite quickly move away again. Well, one of the um, interesting uh, recent developments in augmented reality is that the companies aren't stupid and they've realised that people don't actually like adverts and physical adverts cost a lot of money. So one of the things that augmented reality can do is... Um, make invisible elements of the visual world or take elements of the visual world uh, that used to be on paper, say, or in some concrete form and then put them in a digital form so that we don't have to clutter up our environment. And uh, we ran a piece by a filmmaker called Simon Pummel who came across um, uh, an app in a museum which took all the information from the walls and all the information from the cabinets and the, um, the vitrines and so on and put it into an app so that you could, if you wanted, just walk through the museum and be consumed by the magic of the exhibits themselves and feel the magic of that space and without the provenance of those the objects without having to read an entire non-fiction book, which is the tendency now is to over-explain everything and put yeah. words on the walls and distract you from what's actually yes. going on. So the, the nuance of uh, augmented reality is, is vastly underestimated, I think. And to what extent, um, in a magazine like yours, a project like yours, are you looking at political and ethical dilemmas coming through with the new technologies? We are... Um, because a lot of these are ethical dilemmas. I mean, they're about the moral choices that you make. They are, which is why we run the fiction, hmm. because the fiction is an essential part of the magazine, because it's very easy to talk about some sort of uh, corporate future. It's very easy to be a grinning Stalinist if you're in uh, the digital environment, whereas when you put the fiction in, then you're looking at the individual... Um, responses to technology, individual fears. You're not restricted to make clear one idea. You can combine ideas in different ways. You can combine, uh, combine ideas in a polemical fashion or in a nightmarish fashion or in a fantastical mm. fashion. And that's much more the way people react to the world. People react to the world in a very nuanced, rich, complex, emotional way. They don't approach the world as an argument and so the freedom it gives us enables us to explore the future in a way that ironically futurists can't do because they're <laughs> limited to seven minutes at the TED talk. I, I love the idea of, of new scientists having a sort of uh, astounding fiction uh, off sort of uh, imprint. It, it sort of goes back to the, the old days you know where, where a lot of science fiction came out of and you know British science fiction was some of the, some of the best and John Brunner was a, a British science fiction writer who in effect came up with the idea of the internet long yes. before he wrote a book called The Shockwave Rider which had described the internet so that people would come up to him afterwards and say how did you know about the internet and he said I have no idea I just sort of thought about a network but I mean he I actually worked at News Artists once upon a time and I got him to write a feature for us which was um, sort of talking about how does technology really get used and he, he called it um, he, he called it sometime in the recent future and, and it was all about how you have these big expectations of technology and it all goes wrong he said if for example you could have um an AIDS vaccination certificate, the first thing that would happen, would they get faked and they'd be trading on the black market for enormous amounts of money? And, and, but yeah. it, is also, it is also possible to get it very, very wrong, even as you hear it. I mean, I can vividly remember somebody describing the internet to me or trying to describe the internet to me and trying to work out to myself, is it basically a telephone exchange or is it a library? You know, and it was clearly going to be one of the two. And, of course, it's, it's, it's both and neither. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that the, the, the thing that science fiction tends to tell you about is the anxieties and the pressures of the world at the time when it's written. Exactly. So when you look back at the sort of 1960s science fiction, that always tells you about fears of wars and an explosion and, and, you know, what's going to happen afterwards. And it'll be interesting to see what our anxieties are, what will come out from the, you know, from the imprint. You go back to, I suppose, Victorian fiction and so on. It was the novelists who were the sort of the, the conscience or the soul of the industrial society that was developing. Is it too much to say that science fiction writers are beginning to adopt the same role now? I think many of them would like to. I think some of them succeed. <laughs> I think that um, if we're looking for some kind of um, ethical... Um, development in the way our art responds to the modern world, we have to look to games, though. 
That's what you make. You, you talk a lot about games in the magazine, and 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 you want to um, rescue games from their from their sort of um, slightly um, down market reputation, I suppose, in the, in the world of culture. Yeah, well, um, Holly Grammatio, who um, puts together a lot of uh, public games, points out that public gaming and public play was is the ordinary state of human civilization, as far as the historical record goes. The nude moment oiled which, Greeks onwards, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we need to get back to nude oiled Greeks, I think, uh, and, and get away from the, uh, you know, endless hours of watching the television. That moment in history is anomalous, and it's, it's, it's fading, it's passing. And the other thing that's happening is that digital games are putting us in hypothetical situations and getting us to play out these situations. Are they moving beyond shooting people, though? He said rudely. Well, or only shooting people. Something peculiar is happening. They're not moving away from shooting people, but they're actually making shooting people one of the most unpleasant experiences you could possibly imagine. They actually take these um, scenarios, which are very brash, very coloured, often very violent, but they're actually finding a way of making that work by narrative. It's not a question of making things clean and making things pretty. It's a question of actually interrogating the form that they ended up with in the first place. And that's what's fascinating about technology, is that you always have to build on what's come before. So if you want to do something interesting with a video game, then you have to do something with the bright colours and the violence. Mm. Nick Hardway. Th there's a very interesting thing happening um, in, in a lot of what Simon's talking about, which is a kind of maturity of the digital age. It's very interesting to see, for example, this thing of, of a museum where you can you can have the information disappear from the physical world and have it in in the virtual one as an acknowledgement of of the need that we have for, for a physical experience, for a simple, imminent experience, rather than a complex in, uh, informational one. So that, it, you know, you've got information being removed by digital technology rather than shoved in everyone's faces, which is unusual usual in most people's experience and I think you have the same thing with with games that I mean as a novelist I, I try to um, make death matter always even when it's a bad guy you know death should ha be significant because it's the most appalling event that can happen to an individual in a way um, and so to see that happening in games is very interesting because games as you say have always been thought of as this a slightly mm -hmm. low brow kind of thing but actually of course vast intelligence is going into games now and yes inevitably the market is maturing the games are maturing and they're becoming artworks and they're becoming thoughtful mm. well we've we've explored a few um, odd things augmented reality uh, and so on coming towards us and Ab Jame uh, you co-founded Superflux, which is a company, it's, it's a sort of futurology company um, used by larger um, corporations to test out ideas and so on. Um, one of the things, I mean, there are so many weird and wonderful things you've been involved in, um, and we can talk about some more of them in a moment, but I'd like to start with prosthetic vision. Yeah. And this is, this is an idea, um, initially at least, um, for, for profoundly blind people. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's a technology called optogenetics, and um, what they found uh, is they found light-sensitive proteins in an algae, uh, which they inject as a virus at the back of the eye, and it makes um, dysfunctional retinal cells light-sensitive. So when you wear an optoelectronic headset, it transmits pulses of light, which are which basically is like switches. These light-sensitive nerve cells are like switches, and they transmit. And because of the virus, the brain can learn to deal with these um, uh, pulses as if they were, as if it was vision. Absolutely, so it can so, learn to see in a sense. Absolutely. So currently, we have something what we call the neural song, which is this optical link between the outside world and the brain through the eye, and this is in essentially creating an artificial neural song. It's mimicking the neural song and sen sending these pulses um, into the brain, which is interpreted as vision, and it's extremely um, accurate and it's. Um, it's bringing back vision, uh, very restricted to start with. Well, I was yes. going to say the prototypes of this, yeah. I read, yeah. are not quite like the world that you or I see. No, not quite at all. Well, how different is it? Um, they are working on it. The idea is that um, it will first have a sort of uh, 40 degrees uh, vision. You certainly won't have peripheral vision. You won't have night vision to start with. But you will be able to see. And what we are doing is we are trying to basically working in the process of invention, so working alongside the scientists to help design this vision, help design the software and the hardware. Because as I understand it, one of the possibilities is that you're going to be able to see things like uh, infrared light and indeed electricity 
electricity. So Absolutely. you would there's a possibility of a kind of vision, perhaps for anyone who wanted it, blind yes. or not, that is much more intense and different from the vision that we all have at the moment. Yeah, possibly becoming super sighted in some ways, you might say, um, to say that because your your headset is essentially this computer and you're going to be able to start seeing potentially in uh, electromagnetic spectrums that are not visible to the normally sighted people. So do you imagine a possibility where people go, hey, do I want to inject myself with this virus so that I can start seeing in the ultraviolet? What sort of jobs might we create for people who can see in the UV or the far infrared? It's just or well, simply see the, the electrical wiring around every yes, room. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Now, when you're working on these sort of very, very new technologies, yeah. to what extent are you having a sort of social and ethical conversation about whether people will want this and should want it. Absolutely. I think that's uh, that's really at the heart of our work because the scientists come from a very data-centric perspective and so they pr they created this sort of cartoonized visions of the world and showed it to blind people and people said, we'd rather be blind than have our world look like this. And so that's <laughs> where we come in and we, we work very closely with visually impaired people. What does it feel like? How will you fall in love through a technology? How will you, what, what will your memories be like when you kind of have this Partly plugged into your head. What's that going to feel like? So, so this is like augmented reality, but 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 at a at hyper hyper speed or whatever. Yeah, mm. a, a really, a, a, a sort of this this sort of material and digital um, connect of, of, of our bodies. Yeah. And there is, I mean, we're we're obviously all the way through this conversation talking about um, the the borderline between the physical and the corporeal, yeah. and the intellectual, mental, or digital. But there's clearly something very different between being able to put on a pair of spectacles or a headset or whatever it might be yeah. and actually having viruses or anything else injected into your yeah. brain. Yeah, I mean, some people might say it's invasive, but um, more than 250,000 people have cochlear implants, deep brain simulators already. And in some ways, I've, it it may be preferred to have a, a virus than wear a huge helmet and walk around um, mm thinking that you're going to see the world differently. So. Just just before we, we, we open the conversation up, I must ask you about, about another a couple of kind of cool things or <laughs> chilly things, depending on your view. Um, one is the fifth five-dimensional camera, which just has completely bonkers. <laughs> Tell us about that. It is bonkers. We were working with uh, quantum physicists um, and material scientists in Oxford, and they are trying to build a quantum computer. Um, it might take 20, 30 years, but the idea is that it's essentially is going to be able to process information parallelly. So we're going to have really, really fast computing. Now, how do you take that idea out of the lab and into the public and make them engage with this very invisible, intangible science. And so we created the fifth dimensional camera that essentially takes photographs of people in parallel worlds and brings back these images. It's a complete fictional prototype. It could be very much living in the world of a science fiction film. But by making it physical, by making photographs and stories of people who might have been photographed through this camera, we were able to engage with young people, with children, about... Um, a science that is essentially very hard to grasp. The multiverse. Absolutely. 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 Um, this is this is the world. Some things that your that your sort of fictional writers are describing. Um, I, I wonder to what extent you are constantly watching to pick up the next the next big idea. Um, we're watching them all the time with mm. eyes like hawks because um, anything that substantiates an idea into an object takes the conversation forward because then you're not looking at the logic of the thing you're looking at the thing itself and you're you're getting some sort of sensory or sensual response to it and one of the one of the abiding problems around d the digital culture up till now is that it's taking things that we like to do haptic physical pragmatic stuff it's abstracted it and then it sold it back to us as a as a consumer good. So, for instance, lots and lots of people used to play piano badly, really mm -hmm. badly. But now everyone can listen to spectacular recordings by dead people and mm -hmm. don't know how to play the piano. So it's sold back to us. And it's not even a physical object sold back to us. It's a data file that we don't actually own. We can't pass these things on to our children because of the way the, 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 the legals are set up around uh, um, ephemeral digital goods at the moment. So what's really exciting about the things that Superflux are doing, and the, it's interesting about the way the digital culture itself is developing, is that we're at last awakening to the potential of physical objects and building things physically 
and manipulating things physically rather than relying on some abstruse idea of the virtual world. Mm. People are paying for all of this. At what at what point do you take it out to the rest of society and say, hey, you know, this, this is possibly on the way, what do you think? Or does anybody, and politicians, politics is never going to deal with this stuff because it's so far ahead. Yeah. No, I think there's a, there's a fine difference. Uh, corporations are very much interested because they want to try and include it in the sort of roadmap for the future, while uh, we, we make sure we have enough public engagement with with the stuff we do, either through films or stories or props. And essentially, yes, we, we want people to say, um, I would never want uh, a synthetic bee, one of the projects that we did. Oh, just sorry, just tell us about synthetic bees. I wanted to ask about, I've been wanting to ask about them all the way through? It, it basically, the idea was that we worked with groups of uh, people who were um, very concerned about climate change and about the bee co uh, colony collapse disorder and saying bees are dying. And often the entire conversation is always about, oh my God, bees are dying, bees are dying, save the bees, save the bees. So mm. we kind of took it on the other end and say, hey, look, you biotechnology, synthetic biology, so many exciting things are happening. You could have synthetic bees, which are basically created in the labs. Great. And you do they go, they go around pollinating flowers or Yeah, what? yeah, they could, they could, they could. This is again a, a, a prop, an idea to say that so far you don't have synthetic bees, but maybe with, with the way the technology, with the way biotechnology is progressing, you soon might. I do hope Prince Charles is not listening to this conversation. <laughs> he could be a very, very unhappy man. <laughs> yeah, but the idea is that how we, as, as you said in your last chapter uh, in Nick. your book, that how do you get, um, how do you start designing this world before it comes to us, how, before the technology comes to us? You have to present these options to people and you have to say, how will artificial bees react with natural bees will the natural bees um, get scared will what will that world look like i think that is the, that's the thing it's why i really love the stuff the work that you're doing and and also that it's really important what the, the kind of futurology that simon's doing because it, the the sort of conventional cultural conversation is not prepared for the things which are becoming possible very rapidly um you know in in uh, sort of ordinary or what's considered to be sort of mainstream literature it's very unusual to have a story which embraces technology and most people who read for example Cold Comfort Farm forget that one of the things that happens in Cold Comfort Farm is that everyone calls everyone else on video phones. Cold Comfort Farm has an element of futurology in it and people just edit that out. They simply forget that it's there and we do that with a lot of stuff about technology and so it's really terribly important in order to be prepared for things which are only a few years away that we engage in these imaginative conversations. To have the single conversation that brings the two together. Um, we're touching a lot now uh, in, in our conversation on who controls things, actually where the power lies. Um, Charles Arthur, in your new book, Digital Wars, you look at the three really big players that certainly have been in the past period, Apple, Google and Microsoft. Um, and I want to come, come back to this question of the importance of the physical. But let's start by describing, because they are all, not only have their fortunes risen and fallen um, in competition with each other, they're fundamentally different kinds of company. They, they have three different business models, which are you could almost say are orthogonal to each other. Apple makes its money from the hardware, and it includes software in it, and it makes a very, very good margin on the hardware. Um, Google is entirely an Internet company. If you turn the Internet off, then Google would basically cease Spanish. to exist. Yep. Uh, Microsoft makes its money from licensing software, so it sells software to people and gets money back from them. And it was doing fine before the Internet came along. In fact, the arrival of the Internet was a big shock for it. And Bill Gates wrote a historic memo to all the people inside the company saying, we need to get on board with this. Um, but he hadn't come up with the idea himself. Of, he hadn't spotted it himself. He'd actually been shown it by uh, a young recruit called Jay Allard. And um, simultaneously, at the same time, um, one of the other people inside Microsoft, who's now running the whole Windows project, um, they both came to Bill Gates and said, you know, this is rather important, this Internet thing. And you would have thought, perhaps, that the company which makes physical stuff would be the one that was the laggard, because we're told this is an exciting new digital and virtual world. But actually, Apple were the, one, were, were the great winners. Apple is the great exception, though, because so many companies that make physical things, and especially that make physical things in the digital world as it is now... Um, really suffer. They, they're eroded on their margins. So you think of the great names like HP and Dell, mm -hmm. uh, Compaq, which has been swallowed up. Um, they all make you know, wafer-thin margins. They barely get any money from selling a computer. Microsoft gets it all. What's different, though, is that Apple products tend to look pretty, and they're sort of glossy and they're well-designed, 
um, and and they're appealing to us on a traditional tactile level the same instincts that cause you to choose a I don't know a pair of jeans or a shirt or a piece of jewelry or a watch might very well cause you to buy an Apple product rather than a, a Microsoft related one Apple is really focused on getting the user interface and the user experience right from the moment that you open the box even they have people who are in charge of opening the box saying yeah, what's the experience like when you open the box is that pleasing and they they work really hard on the entire experience right from turning it on the first time to what happens when you when you're trying to use it in situations they really focus on that that user interface as it's called and the thing that they do so well there is that incredible focus to a large extent they don't care about any of the other things apart from what is the person using it feeling the emotion and it's, the, it's, 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 very it's, much it's emotion, an emotional it? business which is which is not perhaps as i say what one might have expected when all this kicked off mm. um what about um the, the the question of who controls this takes us a, a little bit to google because yeah. there was a period and i can remember it well when we were all told that the new digital world was going to liberate mankind from the old-fashioned sort of corporate uh, hierarchies stomping around the globe, you know, imposing their values and theirs. Far from it. It seems in many ways the digital world has shackled us to just one or two companies. If I was trying to t trying to find a characterization for Google, I'd, I'd sort of call them ruthless do-gooders. You know, <laughs> they, they have a sort of they have a, a sort of a, a, a general you know we'll get all the world's information, we'll organise it um, sort of approach. But then equally, they're very much about making money from it. You know, making money out of advertising, and and that involves it because ninety seven percent of their their revenues comes directly from advertising. Yes. Uh, so they want to know more about you, and they they do this in almost insidious ways they try to get you to sign up to their social network they try to track where you are on a mobile phone they give you the option to opt out all the time but it's always a, an opt out it's not a voluntarily join in and it, and that's where they they've built up a vast data store over the past 14 15 years that they've been going and they know more about people almost than people know themselves they're the, what they want to be able to do is to answer the question before you've even thought of it and I, I know lots of sort of young, younger users who hate this so much that they're opting out and they're finding ways around it. But every time you find a way around it, somebody else is going to kind of commercially seize that territory and you will be back in Anab's uh, phrase earlier on as, as I can't remember what you, whether you called us um, cattle or whatever. But, yeah. but, but, yeah. but livestock. Livestock. From we're, Nick. we're livestock. Yeah. Yes, as long as you sort of remain the livestock and don't turn into sausages. That's the sort of scary part. Is I mean, uh, the, a couple of weeks ago, there was some talk about Google and asteroid mining, where they're, they're yes. putting some money into Sheesh. asteroid mining, which is a fascinating idea. I'm, I'm surprised that, um, that Anab didn't come up with it herself. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but what's interesting about it is how fragile they are, because uh, Steve Jobs died, and what happens to Apple? What if Mark Zuckerberg uh, falls off a skateboard? Or, I mean, how, how much of these companies... Are are, are these iconic people at the fore forefront of them, and what happens it, afterwards? It's very interesting that that for Apple and Google and Microsoft, they've got a long way with having two people who are at the top. So Apple had Steve Jobs and Tim Cook, who's now the, the chief yeah. executive, but Tim Cook came in actually to shake up their supply chain, all the stuff you don't see that gets all the parts to, uh, to the factories and gets it out. Um, Microsoft had Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, who was a sort of operations yeah. guy, um, but Bill Gates went, Steve Jobs has gone. Google has had Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who for a long period through the 2000s had Eric Schmidt, who was actually yeah. the chief executive. The Google guys had originally wanted to hire Steve Jobs, but he was busy. Um, they, they've had this sort of duopoly, but they've all those three companies now have just the one person running it. And there's, there's a change in character, I think, you can, you can see. And, and it's mm. interesting for Microsoft, which is really not being able to break out of its, uh, its sort of position that it's been in yeah. for 10 years almost. Nick Harkaway. And this is the thing which is in a way slightly alarming, is that this is almost like a kind of monarchical succession. You know, here we were in the 90s being told, as you say, that, that uh, this would sort of change the world and the political world would change. And, and the commercial world would change because it would all be distributed and the garage band would be the kind of business model for the future. Um, and now, in fact, we find ourselves in a way in the hands of these large corporations whose character can change with a change of leadership. It could change very rapidly if both Larry Page and, and Sergey Brin uh, were, were somehow removed from, from running Google. You have to ask what the company would become in the hands of a more conventional corporate setup. And it could be very alarming indeed with all our personal data. But we're slightly back with the Habsburgs and the Bourbons in some respects, <laughs> it seems to be. Not a huge well, political advance. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, very much. What I'm 
what I was struck with um, um, with this book is the degree to which um, the internet doesn't like uh, a competitive environment. It actually wants vertically integrated monopolies. They don't last forever, no. and they 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 fall over very rapidly. They're like very you know uh, fast growing trees or bamboo or something. They will mm. they will take over the market and then they will collapse. And um, I wonder whether we are going to have to rethink ideas about corporate fairness to allow a certain amount of vertical integration so we don't end up with a digital culture that, however frightening, actually doesn't work yeah. because it's locked into systems mm. that don't, don't mm. function correctly. Absolutely. And, and I think um, after, I don't know, maybe we have to answer our children about putting all this stuff on Facebook about from, from the day they are born to whatever. Um, 20 years later, it might all be completely rendered irrelevant. So, so where, where do we go then? Mm. Final thought, Nick. The other thing is about this rapid rise and fall. You have to think, well, OK, those, those things are affecting the way we do culture and the way we live. When, when it's volatile like that, it's not just a question of corporate volatility or the internet changing. It's our whole society. Is there, in some garage somewhere, the next Google, you know, the, ne the next Apple, which is going to overturn our world, do you think? Undoubtedly, but we just have no idea who it is at the moment. Well, I'm sure there'll be an excellent piece of science fiction in Simon Ings's ARC magazine to explain about that. Coming shortly, thank you to all of you, and I'm Jane, co-founder and director, as we said, of Superflux, Simon Ings, Nick Harkaways, who's the blind giant, being human in a digital world, is out now, as is Charles Arthur's Digital Wars, Apple, Google, Microsoft and the battle for the internet. Next week... We're going to be looking in the context of Euro crisis at Spain in particular, from its civil war to its present economic woes with Paul Preston, Maria Delgado and Daniel Hannan. But for now, thank you and goodbye. In the brain, one of the things that I talk about in the book is the phenomenon of neuroplasticity, which is also the thing which people sort of talk about when they say the internet is making us stupid. It's not, incidentally, making us stupid. It's just changing the way that we make decisions. Well, you've got a great anecdote about Socrates in this regard. Yes, well, Plato reports Socrates saying that the development of, of writing, of literacy, would cause us all to stop remembering things because obviously uh, you could just go off and find it written down somewhere and indeed cause us all to stop thinking properly because you can always have someone else's opinion which is written down. And and it did change the way that human beings thought, but it wasn't a fundamental catastrophe. Uh, in fact, it was the birth of uh, the modern mind as we understand it. And do you think that where we are now, it's a little bit like that uh, Plato-Socrates moment? Um, it, it's as big as that? I think up to a point it is, but it's very easy to exaggerate what happens because you know you have this extraordinarily dramatic idea that your brain is altered by the things that you do uh, and by digital technology. And of course that's true, but it's only relatively... Uh, it's within very strict bounds. Um, Stephen Pinker talks about this very firmly. About how the rest of us can best survive in this strange new world. Nick Harkaway's book, The Blind Giant, is subtitled Being Human in a Digital World. And Nick, you begin by talking about how, for so many of us, it's either a nightmare dystopian future just ahead of us or it's a utopia. Yeah, absolutely. You you really have two pictures drawn for you if, if you're thinking about the digital world. The one is this extraordinarily dark place where children are sort of wired almost directly into violent video games and where no one has any privacy at all. Um, and the other is a, a bright kind of shining future of distributed voting and perfect democracy achieved through technology uh, and brilliant uh, economic models of startups happening all over the place spontaneously and creating growth and so on. And there's very little uh, sense of an in-between world where we all might actually live. And the, the real point of your book, it seems to me, is that the digital future is not something which is going to happen to us, where we are just the passive recipients of what other people are going to thrust at us. It's something... Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4. Hello. We live, of course, in the soft, coloured, smelly, tactile world. But these days, most of us also live in the digital world, or at least on its fringes. And today we're going to be talking about living in this future, which can feel alien and odd, but which is lapping all around us. Simon Ings edits a new digital magazine founded through the New Scientist family, which combines science fiction with futurology, and he'll tell us about augmented reality. 
Anab Jain co-founded the company Superflux, which works on new ideas that other companies want to exploit, including such oddities as prosthetic vision. Charles Arthur's got a good handle on the corporate wars that have got us thus far in a book which looks at the fight between Apple, Google and Microsoft, but we're going to kick off with a full frontal argument. In his work, and he says, look, you know, there's a great deal that's predetermined in your brain, there's a great deal that comes from your environment, but it is, you know, these mm. things are bounded. The digital world doesn't stop us being uh, able to absorb lots of information, it doesn't stop us being storytelling creatures, it doesn't stop us being interested in, in shapes and pictures... Exactly. It, it it brings us opportunities. And yes, it brings us dangers as well. But they're the dangers from our world. They're not unique to digital technology and they don't come from it. So let's talk about um, one of those dangers. You point out that technology isn't evenly distributed, as you put it. I mean, some people um, have ha have access and, and, and power and other people really do feel like they're the, the passive recipients. I think, yes. And, and, I mean, if you're in the developed world, and actually not evenly distributed is William Gibson's uh, wonderful posture on the future. Um, but, yes, I, if you're in the developed world and, and you feel that you don't have uh, an understanding of this technology, the, tr the simple answer is to go out and get it. It's there for you. Obviously, there are inequalities of the distribution of technology around the world, and those are part and parcel of economic inequality in the world. And that we can shape ourselves. Absolutely. And this is the thing that I, I really care about, actually, in, in the book. I mean, I care about all of it, but this is the thing I wish people would take away from it, is that we make the future as we go along. Every decision we make, actually, however small, particularly living in, in a sort of liberal democratic capitalist state, buying is voting as well as, as just the electoral decisions that we make. And so the really important thing as you go along is to to make good decisions on even quite small things. Uh, and the way to do that is, is to gather information to yourself. I mean, obviously, people are frightened of some of the information they get, but that's because the world is frightening, not because the technology is frightening. And so when people say, well, the thing is, I'm now so swamped by information thanks to the digital world that's uh, all around me, um, I, I can't cope with it. How can I possibly start to make good decisions rather than bad decisions? I don't even know what that means. I think you have to learn a decision-making skill. It's not a sort of natural thing that happens to you, just like reading is something you acquire um, throughout your life or you know, when you're at school and so on. Decision-making is also a skill you can learn, and it's a skill you can actually build up 